Penelope Chatterton. Welcome to Awake in the Dream. My friends, I have a guest today. His name is David Hoffmeister. I'm very excited today because we've had a chance to chat for a while before the show and we've had a marvelous connection on a very deep spirit level. And I'm happy and I'm happy to be here and I feel very awake. And I, I set myself up for being quite asleep this week. I crashed in a scenario in my own life that I manifested and I just sort of plotted this one. I knew David would come and be in my life and help me feel very awake and we could explain the simplicity of the real world. And I'm very grateful because I feel very healed. I see a contrast in particular this week as to where I was misinforming myself. So I want to share some of these symbols with you. But before David and I get started, I'd like to read a little bit from Lesson 66 from A Course in Miracles. My happiness and my function are one. Now, my friends, I'm going to scoot down here into what is italicized just to get to the, to the meat of this particular lesson so David and I can start talking about it. Now, listen carefully to what this has to say. God gives me only happiness. He has given my function to me. Therefore, my function must be happiness. One sentence, as you said, David, leads right into the next one. But the punchline is, are we ready to handle my function is only happiness? I think you and I are experiencing that today. I have felt very electric since I met you, and you're a delight. And you share my late husband's name, which I also thought there was no accident because a lot of, what, of my pain this week was over a death. And now I have a nice David here to share with me and to to be awake with me and to help our friends talk about the real world. I want you to help us with a definition, a simple definition of what is the real world. What is the real world? Well, it's from what we just read, you know, that happiness we could define, the real world would be happy. Yeah. It would be instead of trying to, um, as we've done so much in the part of our conditioning, of thinking that we can get the right pieces of the puzzle or get things to work out the way that we want them to work out, it's more of a surrender into just a state of happiness where I, I would also say the word non-judgment really seems to, to come in there because yeah. we've been told by Jesus, judge not lest you be judged. And that really it's about surrendering our judgments and that, that happiness, peace of mind, non-judgment, that is the state of mind of the real world and yeah. that it's possible to live in it. In fact, it's very uh, alluring. Yeah, it's very appealing. Yes. And we're there. Yes. The Course in Miracles tells us we're awake and we're home. Yes. There's no journey, there's no place to go. We don't have to do a 20-part series to show people how to wake up. Yes. But today we're hoping, and I'm hoping you can help me, to tell our friends how to be awake. Yeah. And when you said the real world, can we talk about the basic premise that we are created, we're an extension of love and of God, yes. that we have everything. And I feel like that can't be said enough, that that can go over our heads, we forget that so easily. Yes. We have everything. Yes. We're whole, we're perfect, we're healthy, we're perfect, we're, we're intense energy, we were created by God, we're extensions, and we keep it alive by sharing it. Yes, I mean, that's the premise of, of what our existence is. If we were created as an idea in the mind of God, which I mean, an idea in the mind of God would have to share the attributes of God. Yeah. You hear a lot about God as love, but if we are children of God, if we were created in the likeness and image of God, then we must share the attributes. Yeah. You know, eternal, perfect, changeless, yeah. infinite. I mean, these are, these are the attributes. And 
you know, and also to be practical because, you know, when people go through this world, they say, well, that can sound very high and very lovely and, you know, la, 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 and go around and, yeah. you know, there have been right. <laughs> phrases, you know, kind of connotations of bliss many and so on and so forth. But we're talking about a real experience here and an experience that is extremely simple. And it's only the complexities of the ego that make it seem out of grasp or that... Yeah. Something like you, you know, a spiritual attainment that you have to work hard, very hard to attain yeah. the state of enlightenment. Whereas what we're looking at is that enlightenment, the real world, is upon us. It's right here in the moment. Yeah. You know, Jesus kept like giving us clues. You know, he said, "The kingdom of heaven is at hand." At hand, a hand is very close. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. this, this isn't something we're talking about centuries and centuries away. We're talking about a state of mind that is so pristine and so joyful and that it's right here and now. And so really our only task is if anything comes up and arises in our mind that's not the, that joy, happy. happy, happy, then it should be released immediately because mm -hmm. it serves no purpose if we really want to be happy. Can it and it's a phase of the ego that's that's been a little, done a little detour and yeah, decided to have another tiny mad idea that was based yeah. on fear. Anything that's not love is just quite simply a wrong-minded perception. You know, that's what's so great about the Course. 1,200 and some pages to say basically that, to give us the metaphor, like a stepping stone where he's dropped the Course into the, our seeming experiences in the world to say, I'm going to give you a ladder. And it seems like you're going to go through a journey of climbing, like, out even though this is a journey without distance to a goal that has never changed, you know, mm. that implying that, that once you reach the top of the ladder, the ladder's going to disappear <laughs> and you're going to forget the climb, <laughs> which, you know, makes sense in the sense that if, if God created this perfect, you know, a journey back to God has to be even an illusion, yeah. an illusion of a journey. Exactly. And, and to really come to clarity is really just to, I call it just to see the false as false. Forgiveness isn't, um, you know, still holding on to something that somebody really wronged you, something really did something, yeah. that, that, or that you really have done something to somebody else. Yeah. But to start to see that maybe my perception of what occurred has been completely mistaken. Yeah. And what true absolution, what true joy comes from letting go of thinking that something terrible has been done wrong and something has to therefore be done yeah. to make right, yeah. when it's really just more of surrender into this state of mind. Yeah. You know, it is so simple, we were saying before the program, that it is so simple, it's sometimes far hard to find words to explain that a letting go process takes you right into the real world, into your essence of the being that you are. Yes. And I think we can't say enough how crafty and clever the ego is. We were talking about some examples around work and manifesting deaths and all these kinds of things and these wake-up calls that, that you know, that we, we, the Holy Spirit's been so kind to us to help us get a, a, a bonk on the head every now and then when we get so lost. Yeah. I loved your example about the, is it the friend that was an atheist that needed a big one to mm -hmm. start to, to become real, to start to know who he was, that will happen for all of us. Yes. Yeah, everything that occurs in our perceptual experience, whether it's in nighttime dreams or daydreams yeah. or um, um, on some hallucinated jug or just what we would call everyday experience, these are all perceptions. And the perceptions are just given meaning by the ego in the sense that, you know, whether it's good, bad, I like this, I don't like that. Yeah. All the judgments, yeah. either extremes. Um, I, our friend John Monday, you know, I, I one time was sharing with him the, the idea of forgiving the good. And so we got into the discussion. <laughs> In other words, a lot of times the belief is, if I can just eliminate all the negativity in my life, then I'll be happy and wonderful and joyful. But what we start to see is that judgment is like on a continuum. Yeah. And, and everything in the world of duality has an opposite. The opposite of ugly, beautiful. The opposite of bad, good. And the, the thing that you can just lop off one end of the continuum and yeah. left with the other end is really, we're starting to realize that the course is not going to work. Yeah. So even though it's not a popular topic, I've had people sometimes, and I say, you want to do a seminar that may not be well attended, just do one <laughs> called Forgive the Good. Because what, but what it really comes down to when you follow it in metaphysically is a state of, of detachment where you are, are living in a state of joy 
that comes from not judging. Not judging. And that means not judging positively or negatively. Yeah. And, you know, we have all had those things where we're like suddenly fishing for a compliment. Yes. And we can seem to ride out that compliment and feel that the, the energy that comes from being complimented. But then the flip side comes is when somebody says something that we perceive as a criticism, then we just spin. I know. And we're attached to the good. We're, we're, yeah. we're attached to that compliment, which is really something to take a look at. Once again, do we need it? Do we not feel whole and full? Yes. So there's no journey. We're perfectly healthy. What about these bodies? How can we help our friends with these bodies that we're in, David? I mean, well, the thing about the body is it's it's really neutral, but it's the, the most important thing to do is to start to withdraw the investment in it in the sense of endowing it with things. In other words, if we're spirit, then we don't really have the need to fix it up or to you know do things with it and so forth and, and really we can allow them the holy spirit to interpret the body for us mm. what does that mean the, the holy spirit interprets the body as a communication device you know That's right. microphones or telephones or computers and the internet and so forth these are all pretty overtly communication devices the body seems to, within the ego's framework, serve as more than just a communication device. Yeah. The body is the ego's home. Yeah, that's right. The, the, the ego is telling the mind, you've thrown away heaven, you've fallen from grace, you've got to be something, and you've got to have some home, and so it's <laughs> telling the mind, identify with the body. Fix it up, you know, camp out, make it, make it your home, and preserve it, you know, for as long as you can. Keep it going. Because, right, it's, because it's like, and even these things about extending the life of the body and everything, you know, you can even get into the... Yeah, the, think the, about that. The metaphysics of that, but, but really, it's like the ego just trying to hope that the mind will continue to camp out. Yeah. So, the, the release from it is just asking, please reinterpret the body as a means for your glory, God. I don't want to endow it with things and, and try to make an idol image that will stand before the glory that, that you are. And what you really end up doing is you end up laying aside your self-concept. Um, the things that, that are valuable in this world, power, fame, money, money. physical pleasure, mm -hmm. you know, we could just go on with just a list of those things. Um, What's the receptacle of all those? You know, a famous mind, if a mind is abstract, <laughs> it doesn't really have an image to be famous. You know, uh, a body that has a lot, or a mind that has a lot of money, yeah. you know, you, you can see that all of those yeah. things that I just mentioned yeah. involve the body yeah. and are really part of the self-concept. Mm -hmm. And the immense, unspeakable, just unutterable joy of just laying aside the pursuit of those things yeah. is, is just wonderful because you just can relax into a state of of oneness or an acceptance of just the living moment yeah instead of being on the wheel of time and yeah you know if i just have this amount of my yep. bank account and i just have this much prestige or if i look like this publish this book and you know it's like the hamster you know just yeah. well, when will this end yeah you finally say this is a game i'm not going to play the game anymore i'm going to just I'm gonna wake and up. Enjoy and wake up. Yeah, yes. it's 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 it is easy, and yet it's easier said than done. But I think what we're trying to do here in this process is to help ourselves be very awake, yes. and to make it very simple for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And being of one mind, David, maybe we can help our friends with the, our oneness, the the concept of this oneness that we all are, because we're all here together. We're all connected. Yes. So any wonderful thoughts and any leaps that you make, we all go with you. Yes. And that's, I'd, I'd love it if we could help our friends with that just a little bit more yes. about that one mind. Well, it's like the, the one mind is there's just peace and contentment. All the mystics and saints have just talked about coming to contentment, just to relax in the moment. And comparison is an ego device, Jesus tells us. You know, for only the, love makes no comparisons. Yeah. So every time, whether we're comparing an image of ourself with trying to improve ourselves, or we're looking out at other people and comparing ourselves against someone else, yep. then that is the ego. That's and the ego. It's very stressful because yeah. how good is good enough? Yeah. But if you begin to relax and say, love makes no comparisons, then you can start to get in touch more with just that natural spiritual essence that re resides in each of us yeah. that is there always. 
but it's just been covered over. Yeah, I would love to almost have you say that again. I think people need to. It's always yeah. there. It's always there. It's love is not something that needs to be attained in the future. Yeah. Love is something that just needs to be accepted now. Yeah. And all that means is to clear the mirror of our mind to all the dark thoughts, all yeah. the, you know, self-depreciating, self-loathing kind of loathing stuff. thoughts that are that are flowing around. That is is the ego. Yeah. And the message that we're sharing is that that we are not an ego. That yeah. we have a loving, divine creator, and we are an offspring of that creator. And we have everything we need. Yeah. And if we let go, it will all come to us. We'll be yeah. taken care of. We'll have all those things that the ego says we got to go get. Yes. Yes, we'll be those, happy. Those are blocks, you're receiving it. Yes. Which is interesting. So you almost turn it upside down and look yes. at everything backwards. Yes. It, it seems, I think that's where we can get into the idea about sacrifice because I think that the spiritual journey, you know, a lot of times people have images of, of the ascetics and the uh, mystics and the, the saints that have gone through um, fasting and walking through the desert and, and basically saying, you know, if that is the way to God, then <laughs> sorry, not for me. And basically what we learn from the Course and what we really teach is that, that it is not a sacrifice to give up nothing. And basically you have to start to, to be convinced by the Holy Spirit that the things of the world are nothing. As long as they seem to be something, and people have come to me and said, well, I still think there's a lot of things in this world that I value, you know, but, and it's going to be hard for me to give it up. And I said, why would you give up something that you still believe was valuable? Yeah. We have to come together and allow the Spirit to convince us that yeah. there is something to take the place of our experiences in the world. Yeah. Why would you give up something that you still believed was serving you? So while there are many seeming pleasures, both psychological and physical in this world, and it seems that way, they seem very real. Yeah. You have to have an experience of a miracle, of, of an intrinsic joy that bubbles up within you to have something that's a contrast to exactly. the pleasures of the world. Yeah. We all seem to experience the pleasures of the world in various degrees, yeah. Yeah. and they're fleeting. Yeah. They're temporary. You know, it, and it takes a lot of work to get more. Yeah. We're constantly, I mean, even you, you reach the point in the spiritual journey where like manifesting is a is a key idea, and I don't want to, to deny that the, that has a place. Yeah. If I believe I'm, I'm a helpless victim and I have no power at all, the idea that my mind is powerful and I can make things happen in my life based on the power of my mind could be a very helpful stepping stone mm. towards me understanding that I am a mind. Yeah. That I've created it. Got it. That I've got it. Yeah. But the step beyond manifesting is really once you've gone through, I call it the magical phase of manifesting, then you have to come to the place of, do I want to be happy? Do I want to be eternally happy and at peace and, and at rest? Or do I want to still con keep trying to construct the dream and have the scenarios and the scripts to come out the way that I want, still implying that I know what's in my own best interest? <laughs> yeah. And so that's the step beyond manifesting. Yeah. Because, you know, how many you manifest things and money and even relationships and so on and so forth, it, there has to come a point where you sense there's something more yeah. and that you're willing to go that extra step. Yeah. Amazing. But the, the trickiness of it, I think, is what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing today, which is needs to be pointed out that the ego is amazingly clever. Yes. Amazing. And we fall for it, but it's okay. We're not supposed to judge that. Mm -hmm. We can see what step it takes, and then when we get the wake-up and we have the contrast, it's that letting go and experiencing something better than that. Yes. And that's the wake up. That is what it, being awake is about. Yes. That's being happy. That that's our function. It was given to us, and we have it. That's pretty profound. Yes. It's again. It's extremely simple, but the ego is extremely complicated, and it's very ingenious. Yeah. And I just use those words, complicated and ingenious, as a stepping stone to describe it. You know. Also, when you get into this glorious state that I'm, I'm feeling, and we're feeling now, <laughs> yeah. the ego is nothing. That's right. <laughs> and and to describe it as ingenious and <laughs> so forth, you know, is to try to. But what are we doing when we when we do that? Again, the, these are just symbols. But it's to say that it can't be taken lightly in the sense that that when you have negative emotions or um, fear comes up, fear is not to be repressed and stuffed. That's right. That when we talk about really becoming free, it means to look calmly at the ego. And the only way you can look calmly at the ego is to be in your right mind or to be with the Holy Spirit. That's right. 
to, to look at the ego through the ego yes. is terrifying. Yes. And every time in one's journey when something seems to happen and you start to think, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can handle this, that's just the ego judging what's occurring. That's but the right. movement of healing, the movement to wholeness is, is always occurring. Yeah. And it gets back to, to one of your original things when you were talking about happiness and you were talking about you know, what is really our function in happiness, it's like I, I came to the realization one time that God's will for me was perfect happiness. And that was a very striking kind of realization because I'd heard many things in my life about, you know, well, there was a plane crash, well, God's will, oh. or this mm. happened and this country invaded that country, that's God's will. And you have to go into it carefully because what we start to see is God's will for us is perfect happiness and that we have free will in eternity. But as Jesus points out, there is no free will in this world. And so a lot of times people will associate free will and choice yeah, in a synonymous, true. synonymous way. And what we're learning is, is that free will is beyond the dream because it's our state of creation. Yeah. And that the only reflection or slight reverberation mm -hmm. of a free will is the ability to choose. Yeah. So we have to be look at that closely. Choose what? Mm -hmm. What do we have the power to choose? Yeah. Well it seems like as through the ego's lens of being an autonomous person, it seems like I can choose to do this, I can choose to do this. I can buy this, I can mm -hmm. buy that. What we're learning from the course is it's it's much more simpler than that. The choices of the world seem to be endless. Yeah, and they, they do. And they seem to get us nowhere. <laughs> Even when we seem to get good at making them with good education, yeah. we have good knowledge behind us, we're still unhappy. But we get to more of a discernment and the choices between the right mind and the wrong mind. I mean, we're looking at ideas that are radical. Mm -hmm. We're being taught that sickness is a decision. Well, if sickness is a decision, then I want to be informed about my decision-making process yeah. in my mind. Yeah. I've had people that say to me, uh, one part of my mind is happy about hearing this idea that sickness is a decision. It's empowering because I feel like I'm not at the mercy of all these forces and germs and earthquakes and tornadoes and plagues. Yeah. On the other hand, I don't know about the responsibility that comes with that. And, and yeah. you have to get into level confusion with that too because the idea that, uh, you know, I don't know if I like the idea that, that I'm doing this to myself. Yeah. And what I, they basically will say to me, David, who in their right mind would choose to be sick? Yeah. And what I say to them is, you've got it. Who in their right, right mind, mind would choose to be sick? Yeah. That obviously, sickness is a wrong-minded decision. That's right. And that uh, the next step for me is always teach me. Teach me more about discernment. Teach me more about the discernment between the right mind and the wrong mind. Yeah. Because if I'm still attracted to it, the wrong mind in any way, then that would, that's where the choice yeah. would come in. And we want peace. Yes. And we want to be in the real world. In yes. the real world, it seems the more I hear you talk, it just, it gets simpler. I mean, it's, it's beyond words. It's an experience yes. of letting go totally and going for who you really are. We have about two minutes to go, David. So okay. I'm going to see if we can sort of pull this together. Yes, can, it, the real world is, is highly energetic. Mm. You know, it's, if you can imagine being happy and then you can kind of just imagine extending that happiness it it goes beyond the ups and downs of the world that seem to be just the way of the world yeah. and it takes first a lot of um willingness to even open your mind to the idea that there is a high constant state beyond constant. yeah beyond this world and then to, to let go into and it. it's yours yes it's yours for the asking it's yours for the asking yes. Yeah, and we didn't get very far out of that garden, and the Holy Spirit is with us, and when we do get lost, it's wonderful to know that we have this wonderful oneness, we have this company. Yes. We can get, we can release and say, I can't, I'm, I'm getting nowhere with what my ego is thinking of, and yes. I defer to better judgment. Yes. God always has the best idea. Yes.